Welcome back to Exponential Africa for another incredible show around digital manufacturing. I'm Mick Mann from Singularity South Africa and it's our mission to bring you the latest and greatest in exponential technology and thinking. We're very lucky today to have Andre Wagner with us who is the, the faculty, Singularity U Faculty Digital Manufacturing Chair as well as the founder of Authentize which is a 3D printing platform to help these, these large uh, 3D printing institutions deal with, with their scaling their organizations. Right. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks, thanks. It's great to be here. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what your daily routine is, what you do with your life, <laughs> what, what makes you tick? Um, yeah, so I obviously do speak and teach at Singularity U and we, um, you know, I'll do maybe three or four sessions a month with them in different places around the world. Um, it's really it, it's exciting for me because 90% of my time is spent running a company and you know all the stuff that that entails right um, hiring people finding new clients doing X Y and Z and here there's an opportunity to be amongst like-minded people who want to think about what the future looks like you know and how can they positively impact it it's really exciting and it's a, an ability to step back and I came here I know, six years ago or so for the first time to do a program myself and I thought the worst I can get out of it is an intellectual holiday and I got this amazing community of people that are all supporting each other. And so that's my singularity day, right? That's yes. like I, every, day, every, every day I'll spend, you know, a half an hour, an hour talking to people about it, writing, writing my presentations, making sure I'm on the latest. Amazing. So, you, so you're teaching people about 3D printing and yes. digital manufacturing. And digital manufacturing in, in the whole and why it's needed. What we, what we can accomplish by deploying some of these, what the technologies look like, what we can accomplish, what kind of business models might arise as a result of deploying them. So really the whole gamut of digital manufacturing. Amazing, and where, where do you think it's going? I mean, can you give us a few examples of what is digital manufacturing? So I think the biggest driver towards, I mean, I really think about it in terms of why are we adopting it, right? And, and it might be because history was my first major at university or whatever it is, but I'm thinking about agility as one of the core drivers. And these companies that have been focused on productivity and these manufacturing lines really producing as many of an object as they possibly can at the greatest efficiency may not have the recipe anymore to survive in the 21st century because what the customer wants is a whole variety of different parts of, of products right and they want them at the speed of light these yeah. guys have been used to getting information or uh, digital products at the tip of a finger on their smartphone and now they're saying I am not willing to wait for 18 months for a new product release I am not willing to wait for these you know I'm not I'm not gonna put up with these delays 83% of Kickstarter projects that have a hardware component are delayed that's crazy so all these guys that are used to digital I, speed, I ordered a 3d printer off Kickstarter it took two years to arrive. yeah that's right I, every yeah. single robot I've ever ordered of Kickstarter has been delayed like every single one yeah. so I feel like the companies that produce parts, produce hardware, need to be able to act faster to the wishes of the customer, to different market demands, to different political. We have the, all this protectionism going on, so you're going to have to be able to make them in, 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 a, in a distant or different location. So there's a lot of things that are really driving uh, us towards adopting a more agile approach in manufacturing. I mean, I heard of the story about Mattel, the biggest toy maker, mm -hmm. creating that, the, the, the thingy maker, which is mm -hmm. like this very cheap, uh, 3D printer that you would use at home and your kids would be able to buy the designs and make their own toys at home. Whatever happened to that? Because there was a lot of hype around that I think a year or two ago. I've never seen it materialize. Yeah. And I think that was, would be a game changer if we all had 3D printers in our homes that we could make our own products. I, I, I'm not, so from a, from a uh, utility perspective, I'm not sure that we need to have 3D printers at home. From an education perspective, I fully agree with you, we need to, because if you think about it, we've been locked into this paradigm of only being able to buy the things that have been designed for us. What if I wake up one morning and I say, I want to have this part, right? I want to, I, I know exactly what's going to make my life easier. It's, it's, a, it's a handle that will be, help me write better or it's a, it's a grip that allow, allows me to grip something better and I can design it and print it the same day. And all these kids are growing up with like my, uh, Minecraft and Fortnite and they're designing in 3D essentially yes. and they're able to export from these platforms directly into a 3D printer and what that does to the imagination to see something that you had an idea of that you designed in a virtual, uh, virtual environment and then you brought into physical life 
what that does to their imagination is incredible. So we should have 3D printers in every home, even if it's just for education. Just to make your Fortnite the best character. Yeah, mate, just to be able to allow you to take those ideas out of a, of a ver from your head into a virtual environment, into a physical environment. That's a really cool thing. Or at least in every school, right? Yeah. But we're not going to have that. Um, one of the reasons is that there's just not enough utility. There's 28,000 different uh, plastics in the world, or more now, right? Every day it's increasing. And so you're not going to stock those next to your honey, right? You're not, you're, you're, so if you want to have any kind you of function... You have to pick, pick, pick which yeah, is your best product. Yeah, you're going to have two uh, or three product. materials in there, and those two or three materials are going to be good for some education environment, but they're not going to be good for, like, replacing everything in your home. Like, yes. that, that's just not going to happen. So it's going to look more like the hub and spoke model, right? There's going to be a Kinko's next door that has a 3D printer in it and can do some things for you, and there'll be two or three loca locations in your region that can do really high quality metal parts for you, and it goes on like that, right? We're not gonna have the capability of making everything what we, that we want in your home. I don't think that's gonna happen until way down the line when nanotechnology really takes over. And what about these companies like uh, Hewlett Packard, which is traditionally a, a, a printing business, mm -hmm. they're completely shifting their entire business to become a 3D printing business. And I think they've developed some of the best steel 3D printers in the world. So they're, they're definitely investing heavily and they've, they've, they've done a great job. Um, I, you know, I think there's, the majority of their business is still going to be around selling 2D printers for now. Um, uh, the 3D market is still pretty small, but they, they definitely get it. And they're working. I think each of these companies has to work through what is it actually need, needed for. And, and, you know, when I see HP, HP started with polymers, and when I see HP printers in action, it's usually doing things like shoe insoles or dental implants or things that like they have worked on very specific applications, and they're really making this production tool work for those situations. Yeah. And I can see that same thing happen across Africa, actually. Like, uh, you know, the 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 guys at Aeroswift down in down in Joburg in Pretoria that are working on the largest titanium 3D printer in the world for aviation applications. Amazing! Wow, right? I've never they, even heard of that. No? I'm going to check them out. Yeah, you definitely should check them out. They they I mean. South Africa is a great example. They are working, they have 22% of the world's titanium ore and 0% of the world's ability to turn titanium ore into actual uh, titanium material that is, that, that is machined. Wow, well, that sounds like an opportunity. It right sounds there. like an opportunity. And so Aeroswift is going along and saying, hey, I can make this powder that I can put into these machines and keep all the value creation local. And that's, a, re that's wow. a great opportunity, that's right? That's really amazing. Yeah, wow. so I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that people that are local, that are in the environments, they know the, the problems and the, the issues that are emerging in those environments and they can find solutions to them. And once they find the solutions, those solutions may appeal to other people in the outside geographies. Right now, Africans have a distinct advantage. They know African problems. Now we can fix those with these new tools, right? Incredible, that's so incredible. And, uh, and I, mean, what, I mean, people are saying it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry in the next like, five to ten years. Yeah, I mean, every industry is hard. Manufacturing in particular, because you're dealing with a lot of very uh, slow uh, companies. You know, that people have been very focused on productivity and they've been focused on safety. And the idea that Scalable they... Scalable efficiency. Uh, that you're going to create this like entire new production process and you're going to integrate it overnight. I mean, it takes 10 years to get a new idea of a jet engine into a physical product. So it takes a long time to go through certification, wow. to get the, everybody to understand these different elements. And for me, that it, there's really no shortcut to that. And in, at the moment, once the regulator has understood that this technology is viable and there's a certain production method to it and that, that needs to be followed, they may not have to certify everything as much as they are right now, but right now, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take years to, take an, to get an idea into a pro product. So it sounds like you're saying that we, we at this knee of the curve in 3D mm -hmm. printing, but exactly. we, haven't hit the, we, haven't, we haven't crossed it yet. No, I think that uh, the, the, the realities of crossing some curve aren't um, uh, aren't magic, right? They're hard, dedicated work by a lot of very, very, very smart people. I mean, when did 3D printers problems. come out commercially? When was the first, like the, the uh, what was it, the, ult, the Ultimaker well, and the, this, this is a good the MakerBot? And this was like six, seven years ago. But six, seven years ago, the patents expired, which meant that open source printers were capable of being produced. It's 30 years ago that we sold the first 3D printers, wow. right? And, and that's, that's an amazing trajectory. We've gone from a tool that was barely used to one that was only about prototyping. And in the last 10 years, we have made the whole industry has become about 40% about manufacturing final parts. So we've gone, we've made a, 
a kind of curve already, right? And but now we have to make it even bigger to give you to deliver on that curve give you an example by, by 2027 manufacturing and supply chain as a whole which is kind of the area that we fall under will be 35% of GDP right oh. uh, so it is 35% of GDP but it's going to be 1.7 trillion dollars right right now 3d printing is a six seven billion dollar industry so we still got a long way to go right but we're, we're definitely there and it takes a lot of dedicated people within Africa and other continents to think about the applications that are necessary. No, so incredible. Thank you for your time. It's been a, another great show. And uh, if you liked this, please subscribe and, and uh, make sure to join us for our next Exponential Africa. Andre, thanks so much. Thank you, mate.